Uh, thank you all for coming this morning. Um, for being brave enough to sit through an hour and 45 minutes-ish of uh, network science stuff. I appreciate your, your time. Um, so as he said, my name is John Taylor. I work here locally uh, for iOvation, which is a software as a service fraud mitigation platform. And uh, I've just recently changed titles to from senior data analyst to senior data scientist. Ooh. <laughs> uh, so I guess that has implications for my earning power or something. Um, so um, the work that I do there is primarily in research and development. Um, and so it's kind of a, uh, a grab bag of uh, solving problems with mathematical methods, uh, whatever they present to me, usually in the form of predictive models for fraud, um, in, in the form of network science and the kind of reconstruction of identities across networks. Uh, and device recognition. So it's a fun job. All right, so uh, my ambitious goals <laughs> for this talk. Uh, I'd like to provide, okay, sure. Is that not? Okay. Okay, very good. Uh, my ambitious goals include providing conceptual framework uh, for networks. Um, I'm not gonna go into any great deal of, of math here. Uh, because there's simply not enough time and, and frankly uh, if you can I, I want to provide more of a framework for understanding and for further uh, exploration and then I want to review the basic, basics of networks give context to the methods and models that I'm going to review and then uh, demonstrate the range of network analysis methods present a few uses of network models since uh, usually since I'm kind of a more theory oriented person Sometimes I find that uh, I frustrate applications oriented people by not showing them, and what do you do with it? So we'll, we'll do a little what do you do with it here. Um, and provide further resources and code for future use. So in the extended description of the talk, uh, there are links out to both the slides that are compiled from the R presentation code. Uh, and the R presentation code is there as well if you want to follow along, play with code, you know, if you get bored, whatever. Uh, you, can, you can go ahead and play with that. Uh, one caveat I'll throw out there is the formatting for all the graphical uh, output is a little funky looking if you actually just directly run it from the code. The reason being is it works within the, the framework of the uh, slides. And without that context, everything looks blown out of proportion. So I'd suggest that you just erase the, the uh, formatting uh, parameters for all the plots if you're going to do that. Okay, so uh, first I'll be covering motivation, kind of high level, what is this, why does it matter, sorts of stuff. And I'll be hitting the basics of you know, what kinds of uh, graphs there are, uh, what generative models there are, kind of bracketing the, the range of graphs you would run into in natural and artificial systems. And then uh, get into graph analysis itself, and then conclude with doing hopefully interesting things with networks. So, uh, first question, of course, is, well, what the heck is network science in the first place? Uh, so network science is a heavily interdisciplinary field, uh, and it's, it's rooted in the study of complex networks, which leads to another question, which is, what the heck's a complex network as opposed to simple networks? Uh, well, complex networks are generally considered those that are uh, between two extremes, one extreme being uh, random networks, where things are just associated uh, by some uh, probability, uh, by some probability, uh, regardless of uh, locality. So I'll try to explain that a little further when we get into random graphs and Erdos, Erdos uh, Renyi graphs. Uh, and then on the other side, you have regular graphs like lattices, extremely regular structures. There's nothing terribly interesting going on there, and all the sorts of interesting natural and artificial stuff lives in between those extremes. So there's also a kind of a grand vision that goes along with uh, complex networks that has to do with understanding the world in a kind of computational perspective. Uh, so computer science has shifted our view of the physical world from that of collecting a collection of interacting material particles to one of a seething network of information. Uh, in this way of looking at nature, the laws of physics are a form of software or algorithm while the material world, the hardware, plays the role of a gigantic computer. 
Uh, so if you're familiar with things like new kind of science or uh, lattices, uh, cellular automata, th all those are actually uh, describable in terms of networks as well. So, not departing from the metaphysical, <laughs> what do we do with networks? What, what, what's being modeled here? What types do we have? Uh, very common and fairly well understood sorts of networks include technological networks, like the internets, uh, social networks, like our friendship networks, like uh, all of the uh, information that Facebook has about us. Uh, it's quite valuable. Information networks, which include things like citation networks, which uh, obviously scholars are particularly interested in this sort of network since it, uh, they're interested in their rank <laughs> when it comes to publication and reference. Uh, and biological networks, uh, everything from metabolic networks to predation networks and uh, even neural networks. Okay, so at the heart of all of this is a uh, kind of abstraction. And this abstraction originates uh, with something called the Seven Bridges of Konigsberg, or Königsberg if you try to say it correctly. Uh, and also at heart, there, there is a kind of elegant abstraction that is part of creating a network representation of something. So uh, I'll use networks and graphs interchangeably here, just as a, a note. So a graph is composed of vertices and edges. So the vertices represent uh, things, and the edges are pairwise relationships between things. Uh, relatively simple abstraction, um, but extremely applicable. And so I enumerate all the uh, potential uh, semantics behind vertices and edges for those networks that I just uh, named. So uh, another important distinction, high level distinction to keep in mind as we go through all of this is that you can consider networks in, in many different ways. Uh, the first of which is you can treat a network as just a purely mathematical object. And when you treat it as a purely mathematical object, you're doing graph theory or, or network theory. And that's not really what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, it's the, the foundation, it's the stuff that's presumed with all of this, but it's not uh, applications oriented. It's, it's more about proving things about what's possible on graphs and networks. Uh, what I'm going to be focusing on are models. So uh, they can come in two flavors. Structural and mechanistic. So structural model is just a model whose features uh, of imp significance are basically topological, having to do with uh, the vertices and edges. Uh, but even more interestingly to me is using it as a mechanistic model. It's kind of the substratum on which interesting processes occur, such as information propagation uh, or synchrony between uh, which is a form of information pro propagation. So I'll give you a few examples of, of these. In structural modeling, uh, you can do things like partition the, the sets of vertices into coherent groups. Uh, whereas with mechanistic ones, you can do things like uh, model disease diffusion in networks uh, and be able to predict and explain uh, why uh, infection occurs the way it does out there in the real world. And you can even model things like why is it that when people clap, they tend to synchronize. There's a kind of mutual influence uh, and a kind of consensus making that occurs between uh, individuals. And of course, to get down to the material stuff here, it's also worth a lot of money <laughs> figuring out important things about networks. Um, and it just allows us new ways to, to uh, predict and explain and influence uh, complex systems. And of course, here's where uh, sort of science meets art. Uh, you can be handed these formal tools, but always when you're talking about applications, you have to put a couch in the context of you know, the real world and the problems that you're trying to solve. And that's the art of it, and uh, it's much harder to teach that part. So yes, the network science, there's a science, and then uh, something, 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 fun and profit. <laughs> okay, so let's actually get into networks themselves, enough throat clearing. Uh, here are some of the most basic types of, of graphs. 
Uh, it includes simple graphs, which uh, have symmetrical relationships between all of the components and no self loops. Uh, just kind of the base case of what a graph can be. And then you, you can add structure on top of that. Uh, you can start directing things, like a digraph. Uh, Links being a good example of, of that sort of relationship, it's asymmetric. Just because I link to you does not mean necessarily that you're going to link to me. Uh, further, you can overlay weights on top of these relationships to represent important features of that sort of relationship. And then uh, it's another class of interesting uh, graph, or bipartite graphs, where you have different node types that are, uh, yeah, it's kind of like rules oriented. O only one type may attach to the other type. They may not directly connect to one another. And this is an interesting sort of graph for several reasons, one of which is some, one I have to figure out for my sorts of problems. But uh, that includes something like affiliation networks. So you are a, a member of a group, and the, uh, then I'm associated to all the rest of you, say, here at Open Source Bridge, uh, by membership in this group. Uh, it's not to say we don't have other relationships that we can overlay on top of that. But as a primary representation, it has two types. So what do these look like? OK, simple graph, our base case. A is related to B. B is related to C. Uh, it's very helpful to actually establish a semantics for this. So uh, if it's a uh, reciprocal relationship, it could be structural, for instance. A is connected to B, say, islands, by bridges. A is connected to B, B is connected to C. Uh, there are lots of different ways to represent uh, the underlying data uh, for these graphs. Of course, there's the graphic representation, which I just showed you, but uh, that can only get you so far. Uh, at base, you can rep represent these as edge sequences. Uh, you can represent them as adjacency matrices, so they're, they're going to always be a you know, n by n matrix uh, where the connections are either one or, in this case, null, sometimes zero, depending on what system you're working in. Uh, and you see, of course, A is connected to B, and uh, of course, B is connected to A, <laughs> B connected to A, uh, so it will be symmetric. I'm not going to go too much into the manipulation of these underlying uh, matrices and so on, but it's a quite important component to actually understanding what's happening behind these methods. Uh, no time for matrix algebra. OK, so to, to overlay some further structure on this, uh, A, say, links to B, and B, say, links to C. Uh, this sort of relationship, at least in this uh, in iGraph, which is a package that I'm using for most of this, uh, comes in the form of uh, edge sequences that are asymmetric, yeah, simply saying A connected to B, B connected to C. And then in ad adjacencies, you say it's an a asymmetric matrix. And weighted graphs, this is, of course, significant too, because strength of relationship uh, quite often can be uh, of significance. So in, in this, uh, you just simply have a, a vector of weights that key to your edges, a bit of metadata, if you will, on, on each edge. And finally, this is what the bipartite graph can look like, uh, just assigning different shapes to the different types to easily select them out. And uh, bipartite graphs are interesting. Uh, of course, you can use the usual edge sequence uh, to, to represent the graph. And, but you can also look at uh, adjacency matrix, uh, matrix, which is, a, the, again, the vertex by vertex. But they come in two types. So sometimes it's uh, interesting to look at it in terms of the incidence matrix, which is not necessarily going to, to be n by n. It's going to be n by m or uh, you know, where n is one class and then m is another class. Uh, and this has interesting properties as well because it allows you to count up things more easily, some things more easily, uh, like numbers of connections. 
Another interesting feature of those is that you can do a uh, projection on them. Um, so projection, my favorite personal image of this is uh, actually from the uh, cover of Gerda Escher Bach, uh, the 25th anniversary edition, I believe it was. So it ha there's a suspended blocks, uh, wooden blocks, carved such that when you uh, project light at different angles, it projects a G or an E or a B. It's the same sort of idea. It's a mapping downward, if you will, in this case, uh, to subsets. So uh, in between each one of these connections is a group. The group is just subsumed into an edge. And uh, it's very important to be able to do this sort of thing because it makes some network structure uh, that we're going to be utilizing later apparent for use. So the superficial differences or distinctions seen in that bipartite structure uh, is kind of washed out uh, so you can do things like community detection. So projection two is just uh, projecting a different way, projecting group to group through individuals. Okay, so beyond those basic types of graphs, uh, and I do hope that you play around with the code and start thinking of your problems and how to encode them into these sorts of objects. Um, there's interesting study of uh, graphs as uh, a generative procedures, underlying graphs. Um, and so as I was saying, random graphs are the result of uh, associating randomly between components. Um, and so one, one uh, way to visualize this is just throw buttons down. Those are your, your uh, vertices. And then throw a whole bunch of threads down. And any time they, inter you know, they intersect or terminate, rather, uh, on one button to another button, you've got an edge. It's just randomly associated. Uh, this is not terribly realistic. Because it, anyone who's uh, familiar with physics knows there's this thing called principle of locality. And I'm not going to talk about quantum physics here. But, uh, but, but generally speaking, we don't associate uh, very strongly with things that aren't in proximity to us. Um, but a random graph is something that presumes that you have equal chance of associating with all things in the universe you're considering, which is uh, not a, at all a natural condition. Uh, instead, random graphs are used more as a baseline of comparison. So to the extent that you depart from a random graph, it could be said that you have some kind of structure that is interesting. Uh, so in uh, order of, of more regularity, if you will, uh, next come the scale-free networks. Uh, so the underlying uh, processes that produce these sorts of networks tend to have a winner-take-all uh, sort of mechanism under, underlying it. So an uh, example being links on uh, the World Wide Web, uh, links between pages. They're, they're just a minority that have many, many links to them. Uh, whereas most of us and our long forgotten blogs and, and so on have just a few. Uh, and that's the vast majority of us. So it presents kind of a long tail uh, of the sort of highly interconnected, well-connected folks and the rest of us. Uh, another well-known network that is more regular uh, is a small world network, uh, which probably most people are familiar with uh, in loose terms, probably with, with uh, six degrees of Kevin Bacon style networks. It's just uh, social networks quite often have this sort of structure to it, um, where friends of your friends are more likely to be your friend. So this creates clumps. So I'll show you examples of each one of these uh, so it's not just verbal and you have to try to imagine these things. Uh, and then, of course, you have your regular networks, which you can define in tons of different ways um, that has some kind of repeating structure to it. Um, there are tons and tons of other representations that I'm not covering because there's just too much. But uh, important networks also include things like directed acyclic graphs, um, Bayesian networks, uh, Markov, random fields, it's just tons of stuff. It's quite daunting actually approaching the literature and trying to extract some kind of nuggets out of it. Okay, so this is uh, an example of a particular run of, of the uh, uh, construction of a random graph. And so you see it's kind of like this uh, knot of uh, connections. 
and we've got one out, you know, one fellow out there completely disconnected from the component. Uh, so these are generally connected components, is the terminology referring to uh, basically components that can be uh, traversed. You can reachable by edges. All of these are, are mutually reachable. And then this guy's lonely. And scale-free networks have these uh, characteristic hubs. Um, so you see this guy, for instance, uh, has a lion's share along with this guy of connections, yeah, this one, uh, where, and everyone else is kind of in the periphery of those big players. And here's a small world's network. It, it uh, initially starts out with this kind of uh, lattice structure, and then it rewires randomly, uh, building these sorts of local clumps uh, of relationships. And then here's a regular network. Uh, you can't see the tight connections here, but everyone has the same degree, where degree is just number of vertices, or number of edges, rather. Uh, and so it just loops around like a regular chain of connections. So why bother showing you those? <laughs> uh, those are the ma major models. And so when you're orienting yourself, uh, say you just let's start exploring a particular graph. You collect your data, and you get it in the proper form, uh, and you start visualizing it. Um, to go beyond visualizing it, which is nice because we're, we're shown lots of these pretty pictures of graphs, and I'm always left with this and so sort of feeling about those graphs. Uh, well, if you happen to understand the, the range of graphs available to you, you can start figuring out what family your graph belongs to. And that has implications that hopefully I'll make clear as we go along about methods that you can apply to it, uh, about ways you might be able to clean it, uh, or projections on it to make it, your problems easier to solve. So uh, this is how you get beyond the visual and into actually more statistical and uh, quantitative uh, analysis of graphs. So three major levels, of course, that you can summarize a graph at um, or characterize components of graphs. Uh, the full graph level, um, you can give statistical summaries of what that thing is like. Uh, and that is one of those things that helps situate you in that continuum of, of uh, potential models. Um, and then you can also go to the component level and talk about interesting uh, subgraphs within that graph. And then uh, individual node level, properties of, of individual nodes, centrality being the most important. You want to know who the key players are, so to speak, in a social network. Uh, you look towards something like that. Okay, so. Uh, for the following examples, I'm going to look at the Florentine Network. It's a classic data set uh, gathered by a historian, uh, I believe it was a historian named Paget, And uh, he reconstructed all these social relationships amongst the leading families of Florence uh, in Renaissance Italy. And uh, it was an interesting time, uh, the time in which uh, uh, the prince was uh, produced, if anyone's familiar with, with that Machiavellian strategy. Uh, this is sort of social situation that he's trying to reconstruct. And uh, it's available in the st standard data sets uh, that uh, I have in my code, and you can play with yourself if you'd like. So here's uh, one component of what he was looking at, and it's marriage relationships between the different fam great families uh, in, in Florence in the time. And, uh, You'll see uh, one famous name, at least, uh, the Medici family, or if you're British, Medici. Uh, and then all the other major families of the day and their connections. So uh, one way you can summarize this graph, first off, is just summarize it. Tell me how many uh, vertices I have, how many families, what's the size of my graph, and how many relationships do I have between things. And then beyond that, uh, you might want to look at the density of your graph. So how many edges are there compared to how many there could be between all those components? 
And that gives you a sense of the relative connectivity within your graph. Uh, most real graphs tend to be somewhat sparse. Again, things like locality work against building connections with lots and lots of things. Also, there can be economies uh, forced on graphs just due to whatever natural processes are involved. Uh, and density, of course, uh, corresponds to, uh, depending on what you're modeling, things like resistance to link failure, um, susceptibility to communication of information or disease, so positives and negatives. And in this case, the graph density uh, is 0.16, roughly. Uh, also of interest, in particular, in figuring out if you're dealing with uh, a network that is highly skewed in its degree distribution is the hub degree. So what's the degree of the highest degree node or nodes available in your graph? In this case, it's just six. It's a relatively small graph. I, I won't note that. Uh, in the theme also of connectivity, uh, you might want to understand uh, how connected all the components are in terms of access they have to other components in your graph. And the average path length is a, w length is a way to do this. So it's the average number of steps along the shortest paths of all possible pairs and networks. Um, this can be computationally intensive, particularly when you're dealing with really large graphs, non-trivial graphs. Uh, so I'm not getting into it here, but uh, being able to parallelize and to uh, scale up these things is pretty important. Luckily, I'm the theory guy, so I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> yes? There are, so uh, there are notions of that, yes. So if you're doing like the traveling salesman style problems, uh, you would want to incorporate that into your notion of length. It may. Yeah, weight is, a, uh, is an abstraction that can apply in a whole bunch of different ways. But uh, that's a good question. Yes, uh, it's relevant in some cases. See, this uh, might endless sorts of answers to people's questions. My, my, the higher-ups hate it when I tell them, it depends. But th that's the honest answer in, in so many cases. Um, but yes, so uh, yeah, uh, uh, problems that we're mostly familiar with, I'm sure most of us are familiar with, the traveling salesman problem is something you can encode in, in graphs and solve on graphs. Uh, but at least in our case here, the simplest, the base case, is just when you're talking hops from one node to another. Uh, hmm? How do the, wasn't there a disconnected node in this graph? Yes. How does that affect things like having Great, great question. They are infinitely far. <laughs> so uh, if you're familiar with topology, uh, it, it's a funny sort of thing conceptually. Uh, if you are disconnected, you are infinitely distant. Uh, and you can break some measures by having disconnected components, and you have to throw out a parameter that says ignore those guys, and then just talk about the stuff that's connected. Um, good questions. Uh, yeah, and I, given the amount of time we have here, I'm happy to field anything, uh, as you guys are interested. Uh, the diameter of the graph is also interesting, too. And so this is like the shortest path between the furthest flung points in a graph. Uh, not as computationally intensive, uh, but still kind of non-trivial. In our case, it's, it's five hops from the most disconnected, the shortest path <laughs> for the most disconnected, or, or most far flung, rather, uh, nodes. Another very interesting measure you can apply to your graphs is clustering coefficient. So uh, clustering coefficient measures the degree to which your friends of your friends are also your friends. That sort of uh, local clustering that is pretty characteristic of, of things like the small worlds network. Uh, now, I, I cheated a little bit and calculated the transitivity ratio, which is closely related to this, because uh, I didn't want to write my own function to do one of the classic ones. Uh, 
So yeah, this is just the number of closed triplets in a graph uh, over the total number of uh, connected triplets. So again, it's like of the um, possible ways you could be uh, a clique, which is the next, I, I believe, one of the next notions we're going to go over. Uh, what proportion of those connections are actually cliques. So uh, we went rounds per, in our company around, is this click or clique? Apparently it's uh, a Briticism to call it a clique, and uh, we Americans will call it cliques. Uh, that's the case when things are, uh, individuals have mutual association, um, maximal mutual association, if you will. I'll show a picture of this, but uh, if you're all connected, everybody's connected to everybody, then you're all in a very tightly knit group that we call a clique. Oops. No one hurt? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Um, so degree distribution, uh, this is an important notion because this is actually, uh, when you run statistical tests to figure out which model best fits uh, your empirical network, uh, this is typically what you're going to run it against. So the de degree distribution, um, it's just the distribution of the degrees available in your graph, where degree, again, is the number of edges that come off from, from each of your nodes. Uh, and it looks like this in this case. So. We've got uh, one poor guy out here, the Pucci family, I believe it is. And you've got the Medici family up here. And then everyone else in between. Uh, yeah, I, lesser families, hopefully not themselves. <laughs> I don't know enough history to t really answer that. <laughs> yeah, per perhaps so. Uh, but it worked against them. Uh, that much I do know from the history. When we cover centrality, uh, we'll get into a little bit of that. But uh, so it's this uh, distribution that you would test against uh, the the standard families uh, of models in order to figure out what it best fits. And so it's usually done with things like uh, what's called a Kolmogorov Smirnov uh, KS test statistics. It's a, it's a non-parametric test of distributions. Um, I'm not getting deeply into the statistical. It's already enough. <laughs> we don't have to go into the statistical stuff on top of it. But good to know that you can do it. OK. So to revisit the generative models uh, that I presented, uh, this is what all those statistics look like for the run up above of those models. Um, so uh, all those models I purposely made such that they had the same number of nodes and the same number of connections roughly. Uh, some of them are probabilistic and kind of, there's a little flex around that. So you'll note, uh, look at the statistics for the uh, density uh, and in the random, random, small world, regular all have 0 0.04 and then uh, scale free is just a little off. Uh, the hub degree, like I said, is very indicative of uh, differences in terms of you being scale free or not. Uh, and so there's a rather large difference here between say the n regular chain of, uh, of connections and the scale free graph where you've got one node that has 40 connections to it as opposed to the four being the highest available in the regular. Um, the arrangement of, of these networks also has a great implication in terms of your average path length uh, the degree of connectedness between things, or at least one sense of it. Um, and so you'll, you'll note roughly that the N regular is the most uh, far flung, uh, which makes sense. I mean, even if on closed loop, uh, if you have to traverse all the way around to get to all the components, whereas if you have this sort of randomly available paths that may get you closer just a little bit closer to whatever end thing that you're trying to get to, uh, it makes the total, the average path length lower. Um, it's one of the characteristic features, uh, again, of the, the uh, small worlds is that they have relatively small average path lengths. 
So this was actually uh, uh, demonstrated, arguably, by a fellow named Stanley Milgram, which uh, is pretty famous or infamous for his studies into obedience to authority, uh, wherein he uh, had a mock-up situation where actors acted as if they were being shocked while the uh, unknowing participant uh, went about uh, shocking them in ever-increasing amounts. Um, he also, in addition to this research, is uh, fairly famous in the world of uh, uh, social networks for uh, establishing a small worlds theory. So the idea is in a social network that uh, they were all connected to one another by a relatively small uh, number of hops, uh, six degrees being the popular notion. Uh, and he demonstrated that by taking uh, letters, getting letters together, and then uh, giving them a target across the country and say, give this letter to the person who you think is most likely uh, to be able to get it as far as possible to that person. And uh, on average, he found that within six people, you're able to do that for those that actually went anywhere, which is the important part of it. And that's why I said arguably in describing this, uh, it turns out that people aren't so good on the compliance with things like this. They're like, yeah, 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 I'll, I'll pass it along, maybe. <laughs> um, so it was only actually many years later that the actual phenomena was demonstrated with more reliability, uh, basically in the form of email forwarding, uh, because it's, so much less effort, <laughs> and, and thus you get things like these chain ma mails and so on. Um, so in any case, uh, in, in our social networks, it's the case that uh, availability to others uh, is um, pretty high. Uh, okay, diameter, again, uh, let's see, highest di diameter in here is the n regular, and again, you have to go the entire circuit, you're always at least this far, if you're going to put it in a circle, right, from each other, uh, at, you know, you're at most that far. Uh, yes. So diameter is the shortest length between the furthest components. So in the case of that, uh, the regular network I showed earlier, it's in a uh, loop. So there's everyone has a furthest. Everyone happens to have the same furthest <laughs> uh, path. Um, so of course that's going to give, uh, this happens to be the highest. Uh, and then in the small worlds, lower, scale free, and random, about on par in that measure for this run. And then uh, finally, the clustering coefficient, um, which is very high for the n regular, but somewhat trivial. Um, and of course, it's high in the small worlds, but not high at all in the random and scale-free networks. So hopefully this gives a sense of the flavor of these different networks and, and how you might be able to situate yourself uh, when you look at your real-world networks. And uh, as I had mentioned before, uh, cliques are they're an undirect, in an undirected graph, at least. Th there are lots of different notions depending on which encoding of a graph you're, you're looking at. So the most basic case. Uh, it's a subset where its vertices uh, are connected, interconnected, maximally interconnected, if you will. Uh, so they're complete subgraphs in the network. So these are really important sorts of structures to find. And in my work, they're very, very important because uh, I'm trying to partition my network of accounts and devices uh, into sets that represent individuals, possibly. We have no personally identifying information. Uh, so I have these sorts of uh, distributed representations of presence of an unknown number of people. And that's a hard problem. Um, where possible, if I could uh, represent and project, manipulate my graph into producing uh, valid examples of these tightly interconnected sets, then I can uh, identify communities which in my problem may, I hope, <laughs> uh, correspond to individuals. And I have various ways of testing that. Um, 
So cliques, quite important. Uh, and again, depending on what problem context you're in, a clique may mean different sorts of things. So in our case, uh, we have the following cliques. We've got one with the Medici family here, another with the uh, Bicieri. I'm probably butchering this for anyone who actually speaks uh, Italian. And then uh, uh, this one right here with the Strozzi, uh, Peruzzi, and so on. Um, the reason why this is not is it's uh, only weakly connected. It, it's missing a link between this and this. So there are three different cliques in this case. OK. And now descending from that graph level to the component level down to the individual nodes. Centrality is uh, one of the most significant uh, notions at this level. So uh, centrality just represents in, uh, intuitively your significance or importance within an, a network. So that, that significance and importance can be by virtue of simple uh, ability to pass information or represent your uh, significance in the network uh, in failure, for instance. If you took me out and I am in the highest centrality, I'm probably going to screw up the network if it's pass, depending on me to pass information. Um, the most intuitive, one of the most intuitive ones is just degree, right? So how many connections do I have? Uh, if I have lots of connections, then I'm important. Uh, <laughs> But they're more subtle notions uh, because just because you're highly connected doesn't necessarily mean that everyone is as available to you. So uh, something like closeness gets closer to that notion. So this is the mean distance, the average distance from a vertex to all the other vertices. So if on average I can get a message, so to speak, uh, to most people in the shortest distance, I'm important. Uh, between this uh, is the number of times a node acts as a bridge. So if you're to traverse the graph in shortest paths, if you have to go through me a lot, then I'm important. So this is a lot of, uh, th there's a great deal of consequence for uh, these sorts of distinctions in the real world. And in the case of the Florentine network, uh, this consequence came in the form of the Medici family dominating the political scene. Uh, so that's what it looks like color encoded uh, for the degree centrality. Of course, the Medici family has the highest degree, so uh, they are the reddest in my encoding here. And then the poor Pucci family uh, is out there all in black. In between this, they also um, have the highest centrality. Uh, and as I said before, betweenness uh, is a kind of a notion of uh, access, can be a notion of access. Um, so one way that the Medici family actually exploited this fact was that they uh, played one family against another. And they were able to do this because basically these guys are isolated informationally, uh, at least in this representation. Uh, from the others. I mean, these guys would know what's up between each other, possibly. Uh, but say this family and this family, uh, you could build lots of uh, mutual animosity between these parties without them catching on that it's the Medici's, say, that uh, were basically making that happen. Because they can never get together and compare notes. Degree? Yeah. They're not connected to each other. This, this, and this. And I wonder if that was typical or coincidence, because it could be the case. There's nothing that mathematically prescribed that would keep um, keep it from being the case that they could be directly connected. But yeah, that's that's an interesting question. There are some things that are mathematically prescribed about preventing certain arrangements uh, occurring within a network. Um, yeah, one of the oh, you know, you're thinking that perhaps this would. I wish I knew more history in this case. Uh, so, so you might posit the the Strozzi family and the oh boy, I don't even want to try that one. Anyone care to try? But, but just to go back and 
<laughs> that, money yeah. That would you could, oh, identify power players. Yeah. Oh yes, most, most definitely. So, so if you're looking at something like this, say with websites, you want to, these are the major players in your, in, in, on the web, the guys the highest. And yeah, they, you may be able to possibly identify oppositional sorts of relationships. Um, again, it depends on your problem context. It's really an interesting, that's where some of the art comes in with all of this, is you have to take your informal notions and your sort of domain knowledge and try your best to encode it in a mathematical abstraction and make inferences on that. Um, and that is an interesting process, or at least to people like myself. Yeah. So significant versus serendipitous. Yeah, OK, so that's. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, so that, <laughs> that is an interesting, so I think a lot of, of what would have to go into that is trying to answer whether or not the connections themselves have a meaning that confers significance by their very nature. So in the case of PageRank, um, which uh, is a, it's a, a graph theoretic sort of, uh, approximation method for a notion of centrality closest to something called eigenvector centrality that I'm not going into because matrices. Um, in that case, the act of linking to someone has a certain significance to it. That, the, that one is linked to by other parties confers a sense of importance. And in the question, the domain of, of the question of uh, how do you rank relevance for search? Uh, that is a very important notion. Uh, you, so to the extent that you meet the criteria of the search and you are highly ranked in, within that set, you are most relevant. Um, that's like a very quick conceptual <laughs> breakdown in that particular case. But that's all dependent on whether or not your mathematical representation is actually doing the job of encoding differences that make a difference. There are, there are an infinite number of arbitrarily bad ways to represent systems. Um, but what I do typically, so in the question, for instance, for me, my, am I singling out individuals? How do I test that? Um, well, the way I do it is I produce something called a trust score, which is a predictive score for whether or not uh, uh, a person, where a person is basically a device, because I don't know people, I know devices, uh, is likely to uh, be a good customer, not commit fraud in the future. Oh, oh, apparently I have a meeting. <laughs> I'm sorry? Your session is picked up to the comments block, so I just think you need to go to the comments Oh. And apologies for my alert. I was hoping that wouldn't happen. And then. Uh, so. This is so great. How, how, how far through your session? Ah! Okay. I need to get these two. Okay, so just to continue my thought about what I was saying in, there we go. Oh, is it this one? Oh my. Okay, I might have to slide all the way up back to where I was at in my, in R. Okay, in any case. Jeez. Oh, just to complete the thought, uh, in my problem, I have that predictive score. The predictive score is a result of my compiling statistics, uh, aggregating statistics into both device level and into greater group level, where a group is just happens to be in a connected component. If my partitioning uh, into these coherent groupings is real, <laughs> it should enhance the predictivity of my model to re-aggregate my statistics by those partitions. So that's a little fast. But that's how I would test whether or not I'm uh, capturing a difference that is real. Uh, are you trying to tell whether a credit card charge is legitimate or if it's been stolen? 
no, that's not exactly our problem. Our problem is more on the level of, uh, boy, this is fun. Uh, <laughs> okay, what we deal with primarily is the question of uh, indications of likelihood of fraud. Um, people committing fraud, or in the converse, the likelihood of being a good guy. You had the credit card application? Uh, it's all kinds of fraud and abuse. So not just credit card fraud, but that is one subtype of fraud we deal with. OK, finally kind of back. <laughs> all right, sorry for the uh, slide digression here. So again, thank you. Good questions, uh, because that gets to more of the question of how do you fruitfully apply this stuff, and how do you know when you're actually doing it correctly? And that can be a surprisingly <laughs> difficult thing to answer. Uh, all those neat problems that you're handed in grad school or in, in college in general don't really exist in the business world, in my experience. I've yet to see a normally distributed anything. So. Uh, closeness, uh, so a little bit out of order. Again, uh, being close to things, having proximity to lots of things, uh, confers a sense of significance. Uh, being able to easily send information. Uh, closeness also uh, has a, a lot of significance in uh, sort of mutual influence. So what I mean by that is, a lot of research has shown that, uh, demonstrated in human beings, that your, the friends of your friends have an influence on you directly. The likelihood that you are going to be obese, the likelihood you are going to be depressed, the likelihood that you smoke, um, even when you control for other factors, because like tends to aggregate to like, uh, there seems to be an influence, even though you may not have necessarily even met the friend of your friend. Uh, there's an entire popular science book devoted to this idea, and it's, it's a, a pretty fascinating one to think that your situatedness in a network of uh, relationships has this sort of unknowing influence on you, uh, and that perhaps by understanding that, you may be able to change those outcomes, or at least understand how it's going to be applying to you, and predict things. Okay. So, I don't know how we're doing on time here, but uh, finally, doing things with networks. Uh, so I have two major examples, uh, and then we can talk next steps, sort of what can you do when you uh, get home or get to work or whatever and, and want to play with this sort of stuff. Uh, first off, there's a structural model approach that I was talking about before, community detection. Uh, so. Something is said to have community structure if the nodes can be easily grouped into potentially overlapping sets, uh, such that they're densely connected internally. So I'll show you some pictures that hopefully will make that clearer. Um, so an important note here, some networks don't have meaningful community structure to it. And uh, it's good to know that before you try applying these methods. Uh, to those networks and then going, well, what the hell does this mean? Well, nothing, because it, you don't have those structures. Um, so random graphs and um, Barabasi-Albert scale-free graphs, so the scale-free graphs in that continuum um, that I described before, don't really have meaningful community structure to them. And this was a big disappointment to me when I started uh, net, you know, looking into network science and working on that problem, that aforementioned problem of uh, aggregating up coherent units of uh, representation of individuals. Reason being that my networks look a lot like the scale-free networks. Um, so the way that we overcome that is understanding things like, well, we have a certain amount of underrepresentation of devices, something we call undertie, uh, and that the apparent scale-free structure is not real. And so I had to re-aggregate up those hubs before I could apply the network, standard network approaches. So another messy reality of applying these sorts of things. So uh, in our toy example here, it's a classic example uh, of a group division. 
fissioning between groups and predicting that fission. Um, so this is drawn from a research researcher, I believe he's in the 70s. He was uh, a member of a, a, a social group uh, in the college uh, centered around uh, karate instruction. So, you know, they all belong to this group of interest in, in karate. Um, while he was a grad student, he started mapping all the social relationships between the membership, between members of this group. Uh, who went to whose parties, uh, who was related to whom, lots of different layers to it. And fortunately or unfortunately, while he was doing this, the, there was a split in the group. And uh, so it was precipitated um, around the fact that, uh, these are pseudonyms here, Mr. Hai, uh, the instructor, the karate instructor, lead instructor, wanted more money <laughs> for all of his lessons. Um, and John A., who is the or student organizer of the, the group, uh, wouldn't have it. And so uh, this led, again, to them to get into factions in the end. So this is what the network looks like. Um, so here's our karate instructor, Mr. High. And uh, these are relationships, uh, friendship, that are you know, uh, quantified in a particular way. Um, and then here's John. You'll notice they both have, they're both basically hubs, uh, which would make sense if they're leaders of some kind. Uh, you, having lots of relationships matters uh, when you're, you're a kind of leader. Uh, and so the question applied to this uh, context is before um, the fission, could you possibly have predicted exactly who would end up on which side of the group, in, you know, which faction? And uh, in this case, yes. So here are our factions. This is how it actually ended up being. And uh, before even looking at particular methods of, of uh, prediction, it seems fairly intuitive, right? We got a cut line here. These relationships, so to speak, are severed. And they're grouped here and here. This corresponds ni neatly uh, to the notion of community that I was mentioning before. And here's the result of a run of a method called walk trap. Uh, and then, you know, the faction numbers uh, being the labels of these nodes. So, uh, color encoded, of course, uh, we've got four different groups detected by walk trap. Um, walk trap produces a hierarchical uh, division of sets of nodes. And the first cut is this cut, which is neatly between faction one and faction two. And it also detected further community distinction between uh, you know, the bluish <laughs> group and the, the greenish one and the, the red and the purple here, uh, which of course didn't fission, but still worth noting. Uh, walk trap itself is uh, just one of many, many methods uh, for community detection. And it's, it's kind of neat. What it does is it, uh, you plop down on a, you pick arbitrary nodes to start with, and then you do a random walk, which a random walk is uh, just for every possible way you could go, you have a, uh, a coin flip decide if you go here or there or there, or any which way that's available to you. And, uh, after a certain length of walk, if you are still within the same grouping on average, that is said to be uh, a neighborhood. And intuitively, you can think of it even like if you're dr randomly driving around in literal neighborhoods, uh, the extent to which you're trapped <laughs> in that local structure is a sense in which it's a neighborhood. Uh, no, random forest is an ensemble method. Um, uh, for machine learning. So uh, it, it, of course, uses underlying randomness. It exploits that and, and aggregates it up in a similar fashion that we're exploiting it, but it's uh, the problem context of the domain's a bit different. I mean, one's for classification, typically, and this is for, uh, I guess it's a form of untutored classification. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, that, 
I can make some bridges between those notions, but traditionally, uh, academically, they're quite distinct. Uh, so, uh, there are tons and tons of other methods I won't go over, but uh, this whole family of methods is interesting for explanation and for prediction on groups, uh, on communities. Um, another nice application is network diffusion. So, uh, where states are propagated. Um, and this has tons and tons of applications, uh, but one really obvious one is when that state is illness that you are propagating. Um, but it need not be illness, it could be failure. Uh, for instance, uh, in the 90s, mid 90s, there was a, a rather large power failure uh, all throughout the western uh, part of the country, actually originating in, in Oregon. <laughs> there was a major power line going from Washington to Oregon, and uh, a tr tree fell on the wrong line, and uh, it was in the middle of summer, and so everything was uh, pretty well to capacity in terms of power transmission, and it caused a cascade of state change, and not a good one, wherein uh, the power line failed, the load got redistrib redistributed along those power stations, which are just nodes, as far as we're concerned, uh, and then it exceeded the local carrying capacity of the, no of the uh, edges along the, that node, which killed those connections, which then redistributed the power load, and you can see how this just propagated itself. So in this particular case, I'm going to be looking at uh, a, a model called SI or SIR um, that's used in the context of epidemiology. So uh, the SI model, uh, which is just a subset of the SIR model, is pretty straightforward. So given a uh, graph, uh, vertices and edges, um, you randomly select one or some n of nodes as seeds, your, your typhoid marys. And then at each step, there's a certain probability of infection that is carried along edge to adjacent nodes, which is pretty intuitive. I mean, this is how it happens. I, I go on uh, mass transit with people and I have proximity to them and there's a certain probability they may give me something, I may give them something. Um, at each step, uh, like I said, that happens and you just iterate. Uh, and then in this one, in, in this case, there's, since there's no uh, parameter for recovery, it, you just go until saturation. So this is what it looks like on a uh, small world graph. So day one, and it spreads out until day nine when you have total saturation. Uh, and this example is drawn uh, from this fellow's work. Uh, it's, real, it's a nice model that you can uh, play with and adapt to pro your different problem sets. Uh, and here's the same sort of propagation with the same parameterization of infection rate uh, and uh, initial node on a scale-free network. And you'll notice that it takes uh, 28 days on this network. This is important information to know if you are an epidemiologist. Uh, if you want to understand, for instance, how does one control the spread of disease um, and you're able to represent these sorts of relationships of potential contagion, uh, it can help you, you figure out, for instance, is there a way that I could, say, take the high centrality, by whatever measures, out of the equation when I detect you know, some initial event, some you know, important contagion that I want to contain? Um, that's the sort of context that lends some significance to these methods, because it allows you to uh, predict and to intervene. So in the SIR model, uh, which is a susceptible infected recovery model, uh, it's just like the, the prior SI model, except you have some rate of recovery gamma. Um, and so then what you can do here is, is uh, see clearance, because there's a certain probability at each step as you iterate that both you will get infected, uh, and there's a certain probability that you will, if infected, recover. 
And that gives us these sorts of distributions. So this is just uh, number of nodes infected across uh, all these lines are separate runs because obviously you don't want to just use one run to show you how something behaves because it's a bad sample. If you're doing simulation, you want to throw tons and tons uh, and then get the average potentially out of it. Um, and then the time, uh, so how many uh, steps until finally we got rid of the disease. And this is on a scale-free graph and this is on uh, small world graph. So you'll s what's that? Oh, in real stuff. Oh, yeah, uh, secondary peaks. So, yeah, that's an interesting thing to note uh, because in social networks uh, it's more likely that you can get secondary peaks because you've entered a new neighborhood, so to speak, right? So if you happen to get through that bottleneck to another community, uh, then you have a whole bunch of people that you can infect. So yeah, uh, that's a, a good point. You, you do get those secondary spikes. Uh, these are platonic sort of models, uh, so they're importantly unrealistic uh, because they're artificial, but uh, on, on natural ones, you would see those sorts of things. And this doesn't take into account things like seasonality and uh, other, other things that will uh, affect it. I'm sorry? Oh, that's the number of nodes infected. So this is time steps and number, <coughs> number of nodes infected. And of course, all the pale lines are different uh, runs. Uh, it's number. Total nodes infected at any given time. The recovery, it's a recovery model. So there's a certain probability at each step, both that one will get infected and that one will recover from the state of infection. Yes, in this case. I'm sorry? Yep. So, yeah, this would be peak of flu season, so to speak. Uh, and then recovery from that particular strain, say, of flu in that population. Okay, so next steps. Uh, so, uh, as I had said at the, the beginning of the, the talk, I wanted to give everyone a sense of what you can do with networks, uh, what the basic notions are that you should understand when you start playing around with them uh, and applying them to your problems. Uh, and I also want to give you kind of pathways to further understanding because and this amount of time is not enough <laughs> to actually, uh, I just want to give you a boost. <laughs> I don't expect anyone to go out and start conquering the world with networks uh, just from this. So uh, things you can do next. Uh, there are some great popular books um, by some of the um, originators of these models, these generative models, as a matter of fact, uh, out there. So there's Linked, um, which is by Barabasi. Uh, and he's the originator of the scale-free um, generative model of networks. And then there's Six Degrees uh, by Duncan Watts, who is one of the uh, originators of this small worlds generative model. And uh, if you want to get more technical and, uh, and frankly, more useful, <laughs> uh, there's a great introduction by Mark Newman, uh, who's a good researcher in the area. Uh, it's pretty readable. It doesn't get uh, too bogged down in formalism, which is easy to do with this sort of stuff. Uh, so I'd, I would recommend that as a good ent entry point. Um, but if you want to get down into the guts of things, uh, the structure and dynamics of networks is a compilation of papers, original papers, uh, classic, like seminal papers in network theory. Uh, and you can really get into the origi you know, origination of these models, the motivations behind them, applications. Uh, it's a good book. Um, and then further, uh, I found this book, Network Science Theory and Applications, to be quite a good mathematical uh, approach to networks. Um, and finally, the statistical analysis of network data is one of the few uh, works that I've found that takes an explicitly statistical approach to networks. Because 
networks, uh, how to put it, there, there are a lot of like computer science derived methods for dealing with networks and they don't have the flavor of uh, statistics to them. They're much, very much bound by our needs in repre representing data structures and, uh, and you know, searching and, and you know, pathfinding, stuff like that. Um, and so it was nice to be able to get, find this uh, book that has a nice review of how do you sample these humongous networks because that's a very real problem because you're not going to want to uh, get out the, uh, the exact notions of some of these things. Sometimes you're going to want to approximate them. And uh, it covers how to approximate uh, computing things like the centrality uh, and density and so on. And so using the standard notions from statistics. Um, software and packages. So there's tons of stuff out there. Just like anything associated with data science -y type stuff or machine learning, there are just a bajillion things out there. And everyone seems to use slightly different sets uh, of, uh, of tools. Um, Gephi is, is nice for network visualization. Um, it still chokes, of course, when you get to really large networks. Um, but that's where visualization isn't really going to help you much anyways. As nice as it is to show people uh, these pictures, it, it leaves you wanting more if you want to actually explain and predict anything. Uh, note Excel, for people who just can't get out of Excel, which there's a certain subset of people who just love them some Excel. Uh, it's actually a pretty neat package, uh, pretty neat uh, software that works in Excel allows you to calculate a lot of these notions uh, that I went over for in the analysis section. Uh, if you're working in Python, um, Network X is great. Uh, I initially wrote this presentation in Python, in uh, IPython. Um, but then I ran into problems with bindings. And with I was trying to get iGraph in there, because iGraph has wonderful uh, packages or libraries for uh, dealing with community detection. Um, I found it a pain in the butt. Uh, so I switched to R, which I frankly know a little better. Uh, and most of what I showed you, the images, uh, were produced by iGraph. Um, and it's a good all-around package for, for networks. And then an uh, important one that's included in StatNet is SNA, uh, Social Network Analysis Package. Um, the Stanford, I believe there's SNAP, Stanford Network Analysis people. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the P, I'm pretty sure. Uh, produces that, and, and they're really tight on the question of social network analysis. Uh, and then finally, StatNet uh, is quite nice, because it, it helps implement those estimation sorts of procedures uh, that I alluded to with the, the last book from the previous slide. And finally, data sources. So if you don't have a ready, ready source of a network, you know, network-related data, um, you can obtain them various places, including SNAP. Um, and then Merino, which is really nice. It's named after uh, one of the fathers of social network uh, analysis, Jacob Merino. Um, and then, yes, Indiana. These are just nice data stores. Uh, for from lots of classic uh, network science type data sets. And then in uh, iGraph data, actually uh, the Medici data I drew from uh, iGraph's ready to use. I'm lazy. Uh, and then uh, finally, of course, I was going to actually demonstrate how you could analyze your own um, social networks uh, w within Twitter and or Facebook. Um, but they're always changing for <laughs> APIs. And uh, so as I was doing it, I, I discovered the hard way they had changed things that I needed to work. So I threw that away. Um, but if you're willing to go through the process of uh, getting the proper authorization and, and so on, uh, OAuth, you can, you can grab your networks and do some pretty cool and interesting stuff uh, along quantified self lines. Uh, not, not yet. Th this is since I produced this. I, I have a full-time job. I can't. That has nothing to do with Twitter. So I have. 
I'd love to, uh, but yeah, so, so far it hasn't been uh, working. So that's the conclusion. Thank you for your time. Uh, how much time do we have for Q&A? about half an hour. Oh my god. I can't believe it. 66 slides. I thought, that, I, thought I would talk everyone's ear off uh, for a lot longer than that. My goodness. Oh. Well, great. I'm happy to actually talk about nitty gritty stuff. We could look at empirical networks, like actual data drawn from real networks. So I, I haven't, but I'm keenly interested in it uh, because they have the economic graph, right? So uh, this is maybe a good, good time to discuss the real world applications and the sort of uh, significance uh, of using these graphs. Um, so uh, f for those who aren't already aware, uh, and LinkedIn collects a lot of data about the relationships and the flows between uh, businesses. Obviously, they know when you have been hired away uh, by different companies, uh, if you keep your data current. Uh, and that is very valuable information. Uh, they have a perspective on the economy that uh, no one else has at the level of labor demand, um, at the level of skill demand. Uh, this is sort of stuff that um, labor economists have been dreaming of because uh, there was no means prior to this to, to obtain such uh, large sets of data uh, about something so vital to our economy and you know, predicting wage changes and uh, uh, predicting fissioning of companies, uh, buyouts, tons of applications. Um, so sorry, I'm riffing on what your, your question was, but uh, I haven't played around with pulling data out of it. So I can't, I don't know the ins and outs of that. I imagine it's much like all the other sorts of APIs. I don't know what is transparent, what they give and what they charge for. Um, but it is a fascinating network. Um, of course, social networks in general are quite hot and uh, usually for marketing purposes, of course. So uh, what your friends buy has obviously some kind of influence on what we are prone to buying. Um, and it's also, uh, again, as, as LinkedIn is to economic graph, Facebook is to uh, social marketing graph in the sense that uh, you can figure out what coherent groupings there are. You can apply contagion type models to make predictions about placement of ad. Um, obviously, centrality is an important notion here. If you want to uh, have the most bang for your buck, and you happen to know who the key players are, the high centrality folks uh, within whatever network of interest you have, those are the people you want to target. They're your, uh, oh, there's tons of marketing speak for these types of people, but they're the trendsetters. Is there, is there any interaction or feedback between um, those sorts of networks? Uh, like, you know, like the Facebook network, and the actual purpose? That's funny, I was just yesterday talking about how you substantiate things like that. Um, it's a difficult problem, and there's a lot of snake oil in that domain. <laughs> it's kind of its nature, and beyond that, it's, it's difficult to quantify effect. So, uh, you know, usually what they do, I have a friend who works with me who, who used to work for a company called Roxa that deals in, in this sort of marketing analytics space. Um, the usual question is, what channel is the channel that uh, aff affected this purchase? And uh, what is the effect of a particular ad campaign on purchasing behavior? And there are all these missing links between your inputs and your outputs, so to speak, with these questions. And uh, I'm no expert in this domain by any means, but you can at least imagine uh, the difficulty in establishing those connections and disentangling all the other factors. So yes, I hit them with these four things. How do I know which of these four things resulted in this thing? Um, that is some tough stuff. Uh, I, can, I can imagine ways you can start testing and signal separating, stuff like that. But uh, if I had a really good answer to that, I would probably have my own company and uh, be making lots and lots of money.
Yeah, so um, I'll preface all this. I'm sorry? No. <laughs> I'm a company man. I, uh, my time, this, this is actually a sidelight to, to a lot of what I do. Um, so yeah, I want to preface everything I'm saying first with, uh, I do not claim to be a foremost authority on anything, period, uh, and particularly this. But, um, I, I'll throw a few things out there uh, with respect to this. Um, so this is an area much like almost every other subdomain of what we'll call data science. And I have a jaundiced view of things that call themselves a science because the old joke, you know, if you have to call yourself a science, you're probably not. Um, but uh, there's a lot of hype and little substantiation, um, in my opinion, for a lot of this sort of stuff. And so uh, I think it behooves a person to look at uh, established results as a guide to, to what can be done. Um, also, that the disconnect, that last mile problem, between that hype and what actually happens uh, looking closely at where that disconnect occurs quite often is a matter of not being able to scale. It looks good on paper, but we can't deliver the result in the appropriate time frame. Uh, we cannot, uh, uh, or the assumptions we use, another ca classification of our category of, of why and how it fails, the assumptions we use were just plain wrong. You fall in love with your math. That happens a lot. Uh, I have no way to test the efficacy. So do the opposite of those things. <laughs> Think about how you're going to scale, what the appropriate time frames of delivery are. Uh, Think about how you can test the efficacy of any of it. And usually, you can't directly test it. You can test just to the left, so to speak, of the thing that you are interested in. And I find this in my work almost always. I have to, to uh, find a proxy measure instead of the direct. Because it's the real world and no one hands you the answers. There's no answer key for life. Um, so, uh, and also, don't trust anyone who falls in love with their models. And if they're talking only models and don't have any application they're showing you, yeah, don't believe the hype. Um, OK, so about scaling. There's something called GraphChi and GraphLab, both by uh, I don't know if it's Chi or Kai or whatever, uh, both by a uh, group out of Carnegie Mellon, which is my semi-alma mater, because uh, I bailed for tech. <laughs> um, uh, it is a, a pretty great suite of graph analysis tools built to scale. Um, we're just now playing with it, but uh, it looks pretty promising. Um, there are graph data stores that may be of interest. Um, and, and so uh, if you're looking for a free open source one, um, Neo4j is among those. Uh, uh, something you want, want to keep in mind is there's a distinction between a graph database and a graph analytics platform. So a graph database is just optimized for giving you uh, parts of graphs or graphs that you are interested in. and pre-computing certain statistics that are of interest. But if you're going to do something like community detection or some other higher level analysis, uh, that's a different function. Uh, so I'm trying to tell you what like hard, hard one, <laughs> like stuff that we've, we've played around with and found didn't work, didn't scale, or didn't do the job that we had hoped it would do. Um, Can you explain yeah. that distinction in a little more detail that you just made? Sure. Um, OK. So a uh, graph database, uh, you know, it's in that family, huge family of no SQL, no SQL databases, like right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and all that means is it doesn't follow the relational model, with, and isn't ACID compliant, and, you know, all that. Um, 
like any NoSQL uh, database, Neo4j is optimized for a particular problem. Uh, I mean, that's why it exists, right? Um, and the problem that it's optimized for is efficient uh, selection and extraction of uh, graph components, arguably. And uh, what that means, though, materially, and what matters to us, is that the, the uh, write time is really slow. And the reason why the write time is really slow is that it has to compute all of these things before it can really uh, enter it into the database, right? It has to figure out, are you connected to any established group? You know, um, what are the ramifications for the statistics they keep track of? Um, so its performance profile um, may be lacking for certain applications. So that's one context, solution and problem context. The other context is more the research and development context that I live in, which is how do I actually analyze this stuff and produce predictions and explanations and uh, you know, stage experiments when possible, stuff like that. And uh, I still, I mean, I don't think we're exemplar, but <laughs> I still like independently recompile my data in uh, Vertica and uh, import that over to, to uh, R or write uh, R functions that run in database or, you know, that's how I work, but everyone seems to work differently. Um, but that tool set is separate uh, so far. And I've been looking at GraphG to try to see if I could get those st data store and uh, analysis a little bit closer uh, together. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Because I, I mean, I'm talking, but. <laughs> no, no. I was, it may not. <laughs> I don't want to cut off uh, your answer for her, but I was kind of wondering about what's possible to do kind of online as far yeah. as. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Uh, yeah. We face this sort of question a lot. What can we do real time? What's feasible to do real time? Uh, and and what do we have to do in batch, basically? And um, you know, there's a guy local. Uh, he runs the Graph Meetup group. Um, I have not met him, but I know of him, and he runs a consultancy uh, for Neo. J, and he really seems to know the ins and outs of what one can do with that uh, a lot better than I can, um, a lot better than I, I'd be able to, to inform anybody. I should probably talk to him. Uh, uh, so he might be a good resource locally for answering those sorts of questions with respect to Neo4j. Are there any blogs or You know, I honestly, I, mean, I not? yeah, so, that's, no. that's a good yeah. question. I, I honestly don't. I follow lots of stats type blogs, um, and I follow some like scaling, scalability type blogs. I have I, I can't really name a, like a network science centric blog. That's that's interesting. I should <laughs> I should look into that further. <laughs> um, yeah, it is so. Yeah, and it's also. Oh yes. You know, we're, we're talking, uh, imposter syndrome uh, ha is a topic that has come up recently. When you're doing data science and network science type stuff, it's easy to have imposter syndrome because you have to act as if you're an expert in the eight, nine different fields that converge to make your field, you know? Uh, and their terminology is different, their applications are slightly different, and it's, it's kind of a, a difficult area. Oh, it's, it's killer. Yeah. So all of us, I've yet to meet an honest data scientist that didn't say, um, I kind of know about this, that stuff. Mm. Uh, you know, I guess I'm a data scientist. <laughs> uh, you know, it ha has a certain amount of imposter syndrome. Uh, but I suspect you're right. The domain specificity of it, you probably have these specific, you know, uh, sources uh, associated with them. But the, the general overview stuff, I mean, I found it challenging to, to provide a summary, even 66 slides of anything I consider semi-substantial. Um, 
So yeah, yeah, I, I should look further. I'd like to, yeah, if, if anyone knows of one, let me know. I, I'd love to, I, I will subscribe to your newsletter. The library was Neo4j. Uh, oh, Neo4j is the data store, the, the graph database. Graph database, okay, I'm, I'm just adding that to the session. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, any other questions or? Obviously, I'm game for whatever. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm an unrepentant uh, opportunist when it comes to what I use. I'm not, I have no religious affiliation uh, with, with languages uh, or platforms or anything like that. Um, I was raised more in the R tradition and I do find myself turning to that at number one. Um, and the simple reason is the availability of wonderful packages or cutting edge methods. And uh, if you are into that, into mathiness, uh, then you doing the fun research to find out what the heck does that function do. Um, I turn to Python though, uh, well, because R has well known problems. Um, I, I flip back and forth depending on, on what I'm trying to do. Like I said, I wrote this in IPython first, then I ran into some problems, so I ran back to R. <laughs> um, it's, it's a weird thing. Uh, analytics and data science sorts of stuff in general, in my experience, everyone uses slightly different tool sets. I have a guy who works with me who does almost everything in SQL. All of his analysis in SQL, which, hey, at least it's not Excel, but... What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's when he runs to R. <laughs> if when he wants to visualize stuff, he'll he'll use R. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, I can't claim to be. Um, I just use what is easiest for what I'm doing. Uh, I have a question about your background. Uh. Your bio is pretty interesting. So can you talk oh. about oh. when you ended up where you are? Okay. Uh, <laughs> what's a short version of that? Uh, so I started out as a student in philosophy and psychology, and I minored in computer information systems. So I was particularly interested in the intersect between those disciplines, which cognitive science-ish stuff. So models of uh, cognition, computational models of cognition, artificial intelligence, that sort of stuff. Um, at the time, I thought I was going to be a professor. Uh, so I got my two degrees in my minor, and I went off to grad school, Carnegie Mellon, in logic and computation. Uh, which is actually uh, under the auspices of the philosophy department at, at uh, Carnegie Mellon, which was uh, co-founded by Herb Simon, if you know who that is. So Herb Simon's a Nobel uh, winning, or at least Nobel equivalent, because there is no Nobel in, um, in e economics, uh, uh, economist who uh, innovated lots of ideas uh, like satisficing uh, bounded rationality, like how do you make good decisions with limited resource. Um, so it's really unusual. Uh, the department specialized in mathematical logic, theory of computation, philosophy of science, um, uh, decision theory, that sort of stuff. Kind of hardcore analytic, logic-y, math-y stuff, which I like. Um, then I bailed <laughs> from there when I had a kid, so I could. Oh, uh, masters, I was in the masters program. Uh, which is actually part of why I bailed, because they only half subsidize the master's program. At a private university, that uh, adds up. So when I had a child, uh, I decided making money seems like a good idea. And um, yeah, suddenly things like mortgages and like, uh, you know, how do stocks work? And, you know, like money making became interesting. Um, and I no longer wanted to be a professor, because I saw how professors live. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, I mean, it's, lo it's lovely to, to live a life of the mind, um, but my primary advisor, um, uh, he's 
brilliant guy. Uh, his wife lived on another coast teaching, and he had pretty much his work and bread making and ship, like bottled ship building. And, I mean, he just didn't have a diversity of life. Uh, and uh, I took that as my, as a signal to just, maybe I want to choose where I live. Maybe I want to, you know, earn a decent living. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, and then I worked my way up from uh, bit, like tech. Uh, what was I initially? I was more or less a uh, uh, help desk. You just applied everywhere? Yeah. Uh, no one cared I had so many degrees. <laughs> 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 they're, they're like, yeah, uh, yeah, do, what formal credentials do you have in this particular, uh, you know, uh, do you have Microsoft certifications and stuff like that? Uh, so I got those anyways on, along the line in order to like boost my cred, but. Um, I worked myself from the uh, help desk position to systems analyst to business intelligence analyst to data analyst, performance management analyst, senior data oh, analyst. Oh, no, no. Um, you're moving around a bit. So I was at an engineering consultancy for a while working as a systems analyst I, where I worked myself from the help desk to systems analyst. And there I found that the, the environmental engineers and others were using Excel for their statistical analyses. And so they started consulting with me on how to perform their statistical tests better. And I went, um, yeah, maybe I should just focus on this sort of stuff since I learned a great deal about it. And also I'm so nerdy that I read about it in my spare time. Um, and then, yeah, I moved on to business intelligence stuff, which was hot and then moved to yeah, data analysis and performance management analysis. And now I'm a data scientist, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, it's a really, everyone, I, it's a minority of people I work with who actually have the official background that you are supposed to have uh, for the positions they're in. And it's usually their passion for whatever it is that they're doing that carries it and not their official credentials. Thank goodness. Anyways, so yeah, <laughs> biographical aside. <laughs>